Um, thank you, Fernando, for inviting me back to Barcelona twice this year. I'm getting very attached to the place. Um, so I, it's lovely to speak to you about Frankenstein. And thanks for coming tonight. Uh, ah, this is sounding much better. Is the sound OK on your side? OK, good. Um, so I think, especially after you've heard some lectures on Frankenstein this, um, this semester, there's a, a story that's kind of well known. And it goes, it begins with the story of um, the climate in which Mary Shelley began to write Frankenstein, which um, was part of my inspiration in developing this project. Sorry, I'm getting used to the sound. So today I'm going to talk about a project um, that has, I've been working on for three years, and the, a book is finally almost out. Um, it'll be out sometime this summer. It's called A Year Without a Winter. And kind of broadly speaking, I think of this as an exploration of the climates during which monsters are born. Um, to start this project, I should say I was um, inspired or invited to begin thinking about this project when uh, one of my colleagues at Arizona State University, David Gustin, um, asked me to do some thinking about the Frankenstein bicentennial. And I was doing some reading about um, how the Frankenstein narrative figures into the um, thinking about biotechnology in many emerging science and technology fields. And I came across an article um, about how biotechnology informs the way that we think about geoengineering. And having a kind of long-standing interest in climate and climate change and the aesthetics of um, environments, this, this article particularly captured my attention. And I've, I've left this image up here, and I'm not going to say too much about it, but just to let it sit in your mind, um, by way of suggesting a constellation of images and themes that have come together and been, uh, they're sort of strings that I've pulled on in the course of this project. Um, they have to do with the way that we incorporate scientific knowledge into our aesthetic perception of environments, our ways of understanding history, our ways of thinking about the past and about predicting the future. So somewhere between the satellite and the barometer, between the sun and the moon, between a cloud that comes up out of the earth from a volcano and a cloud that comes down from the sky, um, I think we start to develop a kind of imaginative sense, an image, uh, a constellation of images that form this climate for monsters. Um, but more specifically, what came to my attention was the story of how Frankenstein was born amidst a particular historical climate crisis, um, which a group of authors said with the most um, delightful understatement, um, such cl climatic disruption inspired climate, scientific as well as literary insight. Um, and so here, again, this is an artistic image of an artist has simply taken a photograph of the sun in the Arctic and with a, you know, using digital um, photo manipulation techniques, blocked out the sun, and this is the title of the piece. But of course, this is precisely what happened as a consequence of the volcanic eruption um, that I'll have lots more to say about. But even before I knew about Tambora and um, the conditions of Frankenstein, I was quite fascinated and disturbed by the idea that today scientists are actively thinking about ways of blocking out the sun um, using various types of um, chemicals sprayed up into the upper atmosphere in order to mitigate some of the worst and most um, irreversible effects of climate change. So if we look back uh, to the conditions under which Frankenstein came to be, it's quite a charming little story. Um, as Mary Shelley wrote, writes in the introduction to um, one of her quickly reproduced novels that was republished in 1831, and someone asked her, um, how as a young woman of 18 did you come to write such a terrible, scary story? Um, she, she sets the bar high for all of us. And she says, in the summer of 1816, we visited Switzerland and became the neighbors of Lord Byron. At first, we spent pleasant hours on the lake but it proved a wet, ungenial summer, and incessant rain often confined us to the house for days. Some volumes of ghost stories, translated from the German, fell into our hands. We, were each to, we will each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron, and his proposition was acceded to. So this um, lovely competition located at this house on Lake Geneva, 
in the summer of 1816, becomes the site of um, an episode that becomes to be remembered as the dare. Dared who could write the best horror story and the best or the best ghost story. And them being quite this group of travelers being quite talented. Um, it included uh, Mary Godwin, who was would then go to, on to marry uh, Percy Shelley, as you've probably heard, um, Lord Byron, uh, Claire Claremont, who was Mary's cousin and a lover of Byron, as well as Byron's doctor, John Polidori, who by all accounts lacked literary talent, but nonetheless had a kind of imaginative inspiration. Uh, so Mary, of course, wrote a first draft of the story of Frankenstein, and um, Polidori wrote a vampire story that would come to influence uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula and is, is quite interesting in its own right. And these are the vampire and um, Frankenstein's monster are sometimes construed as these kind of quintessential monsters of modernity. But for me, what's more interesting, or maybe not more interesting, but overlooked sometimes, is the climate in which such a, um, one's imagination could be shattered, in which these kinds of nightmares might come to be. And of course, one can never attribute everything to any cause, especially what could be the cause of a great artwork. If, if only we knew um, this would, you know, make the music, food get filled the museums. Um, but nonetheless, it's quite interesting to focus in on one and sort of see how far you can go in telling a story in relationship to one of the sources of inspiration or one of the causes. And so looking back at Mary Shelley's story and some of the other literature that was produced in the period, which also, by the way, includes a poem by, uh, by Byron called Darkness, which is also about the, the sun fading, dying, as the, some people thought that it was, um, because it was actually quite dark. It was visibly dark in, in Switzerland in 1816. And again, keep, keeping in mind always that they had no idea what the cause was and that this would be a particularly um, fearsome, one might imagine, you know, this, imagine asking yourself, is this, uh, is this weather, is this strange weather or is it just bad luck or does the sky look strange or is that, are you just, have you been drinking too much, have you been not sleeping, have you been kind of have, playing rough on your vacation? Um, so it's interesting to look back at uh, Shelley's text and look at the way that she writes about the environment um, and the way that her characters talk about the environment. And I know you've heard a lecture about um, polar exploration and probably thought a bit about um, the way that this novel starts, which um, many people jump right to the monster and, and kind of forget um, the environmental context, but as, as I'm sure you know, uh, it's a story told, told about a ship to, that is traveling towards the North Pole, um, and it is at the behest of a certain Captain Roger Walton, who is burns with the eager fervor of exploration to reach these polar regions. And the way that he describes his kind of subtle perception, and, and the way that the breeze, the smell, the cold kind of inspires him with imagination and desire is, is kind of everywhere in the text. Um, for example, in one of the early letters, he writes of a breeze coming from the, the North Pole. He says, this breeze which has traveled from regions towards which I am advancing, advancing gives me a foretaste of those icy climes. Inspired by this wind of promise, my daydreams become more fervent and vivid. I try in vain to be persuaded that the pole is a seat of frost and desolation, but it presents itself to my imagination as a region of beauty and delight. Um, and it, this, this quote stayed with me in my reading throughout this project because I think there are many regions of the world now, um, both near and far, that are perhaps ought to fill us with fear and um, being disturbed. But nonetheless, some people, in particular some artists, are drawn to these regions. And I think the question is why and what might what might kind of open up in our way of thinking about our emerging crisis, environmental crises of the Anthropocene if we were to kind of open ourselves and embrace them, um, perhaps not with the desires for conquest and exploration that informed the characters of Shelley's era, but perhaps with a new kind of curiosity and openness. Um, and the, the other place that I think is our quite compelling to, to take note of the way that environmental uh, narratives are, figure into the story of Frankenstein, not only the contextualization in terms of the narration aboard a ship, but of the story itself is in this kind of um, reality trick 
that Frankenstein himself, Victor Frankenstein himself uses in his conversation with, with Walton, but also implicitly with us, with the reader. Um, in a way, it's a conversation between Frankenstein, uh, Victor and Roger, it's between Victor and the reader, and it's between Mary Shelley and the reader. And she said, he says at one point, prepare to hear of occurrences that are usually deemed marvelous. Were we among tamer scenes of nature, I might fear to encounter your unbelief, perhaps your ridicule. But many things will appear possible in these wild and mysterious regions which would provoke the laughter of those unacquainted with the ever varied powers of nature. Um, and of course, for historians of science, acquaintance with the ever varied powers of nature and the way how, how different these have um, become known to us over the course of the history of science is particularly provocative. There's a great deal in the history of science that would we might think to consign to the realm of literature today, but in other historical moments would be appreciated as clues to other orders of nature or um, other sorts of monsters or, or creatures that were long thought to inhabit kind of the world at its fringes. Um, there would be monsters at the edges of the earth. Um, so in this case, Victor invokes this kind of acquaintance with the extremes, in this case of the North Pole or of the Arctic regions, in order to invoke, you know, induce us to believe that he could have done what he claims to have done, namely brought a being to life after he had pieced it together and sewn it together from the charnel house. Um, so again, it's a clue to um, how we might be inspired to think otherwise by our environments. And also a question, um, what if the environment kind of shatters our imagination and makes us open to imagining new things, what might they be? They might be new beings, they might be monsters, or who, who knows what else they might be. There's nothing, um, you, it's, it's hard for me at least to come up with a causal story that would say there's a climate crisis, therefore we imagine a monster. It could have been anything else that, um, that Mary or these other authors had come up with. But of course, they couldn't possibly have known what was causing the climate crises that they encountered. Um, they began their travels during the beginning of the summer of 1816. That summer would come to be known in its time as the year without a summer. But in fact, it was the climate crisis that would last three years. Um, until 1818, there was extremely abnormal weather. This was all in the context of a very cold period, um, sometimes called the, the Little Ice Age of the early 19th century. But this three-year period was especially intense in the Northern Hemisphere, which is the source from which it is narrated in this, um, in this project. Um, there were, in this case, um, snow in summer in parts of North America. There was extreme rain and flooding and frost, um, massive crop failures, so food insecurity led to um, rioting, to political instability. There were health consequences, not only malnutrition and spread of disease, um, but also some, some historical reconstructions have said that this was instrumental in um, the spread of the cholera epidemic from the Indian subcontinent um, through Central Asia and into Europe. This is at least a very plausible argument. Um, of course, there were also political effects. There was the um, weakening of European colonial powers and new political configurations emerging in, within Europe. And Frankenstein is not the only um, significant, memorable artwork uh, made during this period. There's also a profusion of Gothic poetry um, in, that refers to the weather and, um, and the climate within the European tradition. Um, Jill and Darcy Wood has written an incredible book, Tambora, The Eruption That Changed the World, um, in which he tries to retrace and reconstruct the global historical events of this period so that is, we don't only have this very well uh, articulated European tradition, but he also evinces poetry from China, from Southeast Asia, um, kind of different ways that this climate crisis was being registered. Only much, much later would we, not until 1991, in fact, um, according to the scientific literature, there, are other, there were hypotheses advanced before then, was it kind of definitively asserted that this climate crisis was caused by the volcanic eruption of Mount Tambora on April 10th or 12th, 1815. 
Um, it, it is recorded, was reported to have caused vast destruction locally, killing upwards of 100,000 people within the coming months by blanketing the whole region on the Indonesian island of Sumbawa and surrounding islands with a heavy coat of ash and um, toxic gases. But the global effects wouldn't be felt until the following year. And they're due to the fact that the te this eruption was the largest of the last 10,000 years, and it was strong enough to eject superheated gases and ash all the way up into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere, where they could be circulated around the globe, whereas normally they would precipitate out in the, in the local region. Um, and this, of course, is the source of inspiration for contemporary scientists and geoengineers who are now thinking about mimicking the effects of volcanic eruptions and injecting sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere in order precisely to once again block out the sun. Um, and this, this is one of the paintings that sort of evokes this. There was, there's a profusion of paintings that show a darkened atmosphere in the um, European landscape painting tradition of so Caspar David Friedrich, for example, um, paints the famous painting, The Wanderer Above the Sea of Ice, um, of a man, a sort of quite familiar um, evocative image of a man standing on the top of a mountain, looking out at over this kind of bright but also dim sky. Um, and one imagines that this is a, you know, English gentleman having gone on the grand tour and has climbed the Alps. But in fact, this is a painting painted in 1818 and he's actually looking also at a sea of um, ice and air saturated by Tambora's gases and sunlight blocked by um, Tambora's ash somewhere very high in the stratosphere. So there's a sense in which we have become familiar with some of the creative responses to this era and the way that they were subtly perceived long before we ever had a kind of grand narrative or a scientific um, interpretation of what caused these interconnected events. So it's a global picture that emerges much, much, much later which is instructive, I think, for thinking about the conditions that we face today. So I was inspired by, first of all, the rhetorical uh, appeal of this um, description of the year without a summer. And um, I began this project in collaboration with a futurist, a scholar named Cynthia Celine. Um, and we started to think, well, think about the idea that, you know, if a year without a summer brought us some of the most compelling literature and visual art of its period, what might happen during a, a year without a winter? And initially, the way that we construed this project was as a question about at some point in the future, there would be a year without a winter. So the first question was, well, when would that be? Um, in fact, we collaborated with meteorologists and climatologists from the National Center for Atmospheric Research who took an interest in that question, um, first of all, in, in simply defining what a year without a winter would mean um, as something more than a rhetorical, uh, a kind of compelling rhetorical phrase, but, but not at all specific meteorologically. Um, so they, they took on this project of, of trying to think how they would specify that, and it would be a, a kind of change in average temperature such that um, this, I should say, is one of many possible interpretations that they offered. When the warmest winters of the past are now um, the ones that are the norm in the at a certain point in the future. So that this might happen around the mid-century, they estimated. Um, so at first, we envisioned a series of scenario exercises that would get people thinking, what would happen during a year without a winter? Would the tourism industry in my local um, economy collapse? Would I be missing particular foods? Get us thinking about how dependent we actually are on particular climatic circumstances. But what happened, in fact, was that uh, as we started the project, 2015, 16, and I think now we're well into um, seven, 17 and now 18, have become the hottest years on record. Um, and it seemed that a year without a winter had arrived already, just in time for the book, which is always lovely rhetorically, although it bodes ill for um, the real facts of the, the planet. Um, and we are now in a very different situation to the one that they faced in the midst of the Tambora crisis. Um, most especially because we have a profusion of scientific information about what's going on now and what's going on in the future. Um, and we have a a kind of communications infrastructure that allows us to know in real time what's going on in, 
vastly geographically disparate parts of the world. Um, so this, I think, issues and even these highly unusual situations where, for example, it was reported during the 2004 tsunami in the, the Indian Ocean, people received tsunami warnings in Sweden uh, before the wave landed in Thailand or in India, even so much that they could call relatives and say, hey, did you, um, did you hear this? Like, get away from the beach. So information travels so fast. It travels much faster than clouds do. Um, so we're in a position to have a very different kind of immersion and awareness of the climate crisis unfolding around us. But some of the aspects of this climate crisis are very similar. It was, a, it was cooling then, it's warming now, but likewise, the weather is becoming more variable, extreme, unpredictable, um, where we also have to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty, even though we have more information in some ways, um, where we face just as much uncertainty because of the interconnectedness of our economies and ecologies. Um, likewise, the glaciers are melting in the poli polar regions, which strangely they also did during the Tambora crisis due to certain um, distortions of the, the wind currents and ocean currents, which I, I can't say too much about. But there are um, always features of, the, of a kind of global disturbance in the climate system that will be surprising. And there will be cold and there will be warmth and wetness and dryness in places that it's unexpected. Um, and this is certainly the case already, even though we face an average condition of warming. And likewise, there are health consequences, there are security consequences, and opportunities for social and economic changes, and also of, of tr really dangers. Climate always exerts a stress on whatever other conditions are affecting the conditions of people's lives. Um, and it's also becoming immediately visible. And this image, I think, is just one of many that are starting to become rhetorically part of our visual rec rhetoric of um, rising sea levels, the daily, the high water mark in cities, even like Miami or Venice, is something that people contend with on a, a daily basis. They dress for high, wa high water. We drive through high water. Um, so there's a sense in which we are already living in a condition that could have been described as a year without a winter. But there's one significant difference that we're in a position to recognize, which is that this project really um, addresses a climate crisis that is not definitive, it's not bounded historically. This is about trends rather than about a temporary aberration. Um, a year without a winter is really about a year without a future without a winter or a year without stable seasons or a future without the kind of regularities that we have even called seasons in the past. So it's kind of fundamentally a challenge to what our sense of climate has been historically and what it might become in the future. And this is, of course, consistent with a new conception of the Earth as what a space in which we intervene. Um, I won't sort of get into the debates about the Anthropocene and whether this is a useful terminology or not. I tend to use it, although I think it's interestingly problematic. Um, but I just wanted to highlight one um, comment that has come up in some of the scientific literature making an effort to define the Anthropocene. This was um, one of the efforts to decide when it, when it began. And the authors say, we're a ge geological force of nature, but that power is like, unlike any other force of nature in that it is reflexive and can be used, withdrawn, or modified. And I think this is, I, I think this is particularly important in the sense that Self-reflexivity is not a topic that normally comes up for discussion in, a, uh, in nature uh, or in, among geologists. The idea that our self-consciousness and our way of intervening and representing the earth, nature, whatever we are going to call our environments these days, um, is, a, is a sort of consequential to our exercise of, of force as a species or as member, certain members of that species, I think is an argument for um, moving past, you know, this kind of traditional divisions between the arts and the sciences and kind of integrating the, the roles, uh, understanding that our philosophical and artistic ways of, un of imagining um, the environment we live in is highly consequential for its physical conditions. And it's, it's striking that this is, this is not something that only comes from the humanities, but is also recognized in the pages of nature.
Um, so as I mentioned, I, I'm going to skip through this briefly, but um, these are some of the charts that were produced by our um, meteorological collaborators. And I think even in the past two years since we have done this, they have been struck. I think everyone has been surprised by the rate at which uh, climate change has accelerated, such that this might not be the most plausible um, speculation at the, anymore. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it was very interesting for us along the course of the project in, in posing the problem um, of what it would mean to define a year without a winter meteorologically. Um, but this is all the more reason that it also is a question that needs to be answered in the space of the arts, of philosophy, of history. So one of the ways that we did that was, um, and I, I should say, our, the sort of first goal of this project was simply to reenact the dare. I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to kind of go back to Lake Geneva with a group of um, writers, maybe science fiction authors, and you know, see have them write stories again today. Um, but from that point of departure, it, we started to think about, um, well, you know, should we go to Lake Geneva? Is that the rele most relevant place to think about climate change today? Or perhaps it should be um, somewhere else in the world that is where climate change is being felt, um, where its consequences are more apparent. Although perhaps, you know, Lake Geneva is also an interesting spot. Um, but for various reasons, um, some practical, some um, theoretical, it was decided that we would instead go out into the Arizona desert, um, accompanied by four science fiction writers, uh, um, uh, several scientists, my colleague, um, the scenario planner, and my colleagues at the um, Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University. Um, we decided to hold this retreat, a kind of re historical reenactment of this uh, summer holiday that Mary and company took at the Villa Diodati, this house on Lake Geneva, we decided to go to Arcosanti, which is an experimental town designed by the architect Paolo Soleri in the 1960s and 70s. And it, you know, it looks, it's all, it has actually figured in science fiction and in um, science fiction literature and movies. It looks like the kind of place where you might I imagine a monster even on a, a day when the weather is good. Um, so we, you know, of course, hope that it would be an inspiring and interesting place for conducting this kind of group thought experiment. Um, we were joined there by Vandana Singh, Tobias Bakel, and uh, Nnedi Okorafor, and Nancy Kress, who are, uh, as it turns out, a, a really wonderful collection of science fiction authors. And they, um, they joined us for three days, and we, in that, time we also heard lectures by scientists, geoengineers who were quite, some of whom were quite enthusiastic, others of whom were quite critical of the prospect of um, conducting some of these global experiments. Um, one of whom, Hilary Hartnett, is an, an oceanographer who has had a, a very provocative paper recently published about a technology to refreeze the Arctic and make it uh, increase its uh, albedo, increase its uh, ability to reflect light. Um, so at a certain point, we felt a bit as though we were out there on the limb with the Frankenstein, or Victor Frankensteins of the day, um, the people who were conducting these kinds of experiments with the condition of the planet, which of course could save us all or could release monsters. Um, and we were particularly happy that they were willing to have this conversation um, with pot their potential critics as opposed to kind of continue their experiments behind the closed doors of the uh, the operating theater was a kind of a traditional image of the mad scientist. Um, so yeah, some trips to the archive. I should say that these stories, they are collected in, in the book that's out later this summer along with a, a series of essays about the history of Tambora, the history of Frankenstein, this um, the architecture, the history of this architectural experiment as well and some new writings from Dylan Darcy Wood about his climb to Tambora, and writings by myself and another curator about the kind of new and emerging artwork that is coming out um, in response to these encounters with extreme environments. But the stories are also published, it will also be published for free online over the course of this year, and this is the first one by Nadia Okorafor, um, who also wrote for Black Panther, which is very exciting, um, and her, her story tells the, is an account of a future, a kind of 
fictive future set in Nigeria in which, um, in order to combat the worst effects of climate change, most of the world is planted with a genetically modified crop, a certain, a certain kind of flower. And it sounds very charming and beautiful, and it's like really cute in the beginning of the story. And um, the problem is that her protagonist is allergic to the pollen from this plant. And luckily, she lives in a uh, smart house which eventually rebuilds itself over the course of her pregnancy in order to confine her and the baby to this house. And it's a really incredible story. I'll, I'll say, I won't say too much more about what happens or um, you know, the success of this, but it's a real um, kind of constellation of monsters that come to be presented in the story. There's the monstrosity of the environment, the monstrosity of the re response to its condition, the monstrosity of the cure, you could say, um, and then this house that kind of comes alive and this, this way of living within it. So it's suggestive, as are many of, uh, are really all of the other stories, of the kind of expanded scope in which we have to think about monsters today. Um, it's no longer enough to think about, as, as we see from the way that Frankenstein disseminates into pop popular culture, it's no longer adequate to think about a monster as like a funny looking creature that hides off in the shadows somewhere. Um, the, the idea of monstrosity that Mary Shelley give, gives to us is extremely useful also for thinking about environments, technologies, um, architectures. So um, this, this was an incredible kind of response to the dare um, to reiterate it in, within the genre of science fiction. But it was also interesting to consider whether science fiction is, is really the, the right genre. Will there, if, if we think, okay, we're still reading this novel that was written in the 18th century, or in the 19th century. Um, if we wanna think in 200 years, will people still be looking at some sort of artwork or reading a piece of literature that was written today? Will it be a novel or maybe would it be something else? Would it be another genre? Would it be a digital format? Would it be um, something else? So. We wanted to open up that question as well as the geographical question of where the dare should be staged. Um, so in a year without a winter, perhaps it's the, de the desert rather than the mountains, and perhaps it's an outfit rather than a work of science fiction. Um, this was a, just one of the many um, genres that we explored, um, speculative fashion design. Uh, we looked at the way that climatological awareness is being expressed in, on the, from the runways to the art galleries in designs such as this, a dress that inflates when you go in the water, in a, in a very charming, bucolic kind of camping scene, but just in case is also convenient. Um, or this artist, in, um, Anne Van Galen, who did a whole series of works like this, um, but which were called, it was designed for, it was as outfits for dressing in a world of endless rainfall. So she imagined a future in which um, we no longer tried to insulate ourselves from the rain, but rather to expose our bodies as much as possible and only give ourselves the kind of minimal protection, both in terms of um, social appropriateness and kind of physical protection from a fundamentally altered environment. And you could imagine this environment as the one that we would actually have here on this earth, or of course there's lots of talk about living on other planets, which I think is a little uh, problematic in other ways, but um, if we're going to dream of living in other worlds, I think we need to think very critically about some of the aspects of everyday life that would be changed from our clothing to our diet. Um, even some of the more familiar activities that we have would, could be radically rethought. Um, so another work, switching genres entirely um, and kind of coming back to the scientific tradition was a, a project by an artist named Carolina Sobeka who imagined a highly Frankenstein-like experiment um, merging biotechnology and uh, geoengineering. She proposes to modify the bacteria that inhabit clouds, modify the DNA of the bacteria that inhabit clouds, um, which could have an effect on the weather, but her interest rather is in using them as data storage devices. So we're quite used to the idea that we can just, you know, save something to the cloud or, you know, save it into the email or into that endless draft, oops, sorry, of um, 
copies and you know we have this kind of immense data storage that I think just uh, just thinking through this piece has gotten me very self-conscious about every time I refresh my email for example um, how how data intense um, that process is and it's also something that is a, actually data storage is a huge source of climate um, of carbon emissions so she proposes a kind of passive uh, data data storage system that would allow um, data to be stored directly in clouds um, via the bacteria that can that cause ice nucleation. Um, and she has been promoting this with a degree of seriousness and also a degree of playfulness, um, but really asking us to think about whether we could incorporate our um, digital age into directly into the kind of environmental processes that it actually has a great effect on. But here at an, um, a festival that we held in, for the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein last year, also in Arizona, we have her performing in a way the role of Frankenstein. And the idea of this performance, she's here um, conducting the experiment, but it's also a way of staging a, a conversation about um, the regulation and governance of geoengineering technologies, of biotechnologies. And in some ways, um, these discussions are more familiar from biotechnologies, where monsters um, are more personified. You know, they're Dolly the clone sheep or um, strange-looking bunnies or frogs. Clouds, uh, they're not they're not so charismatic and they're not so troubling. Um, they all look rather similar, even the really genetically modified ones. Um, so this project, as part of this project, she d conducts a series of um, reconstructions of historical clouds. So the first one on, on the right in this um, series is the Tambora cloud, in fact. This is the, she, she uses dust and chemicals from, um, that are approximate what scientists think came out of the mountain 200 years ago to create a cloud. As you can see, it doesn't look so different from the others. The second is the first cloud um, developed to do rain seeding, so um, weather modification in the 1950s. And the third is a cloud that is part of a proposed geoengineering experiment, which hasn't yet happened, but is meant to happen in the Arizona desert next year, or perhaps sometime this year. And there's a lot of debate about the future of geoengineering, but I guess I've, I've been um, attending conferences and kind of working actively with geoengineers over the last few years, just out of, really out of curiosity, and I'm more and more persuaded that it's, um, I, it's, it's a reality to be taken seriously in the same way that a lot of biotechnologies that were initially resisted, or um, actually, as, as Fernando has discussed, things like, um, you know, had transplants of various bodily organs, they seem completely unthinkable, but they gradually, um, through experimentation and application, come to seem actually perfectly acceptable. And I think geoengineering is moving in that direction for better or for worse. Um, so it's something really to take seriously. And if an artwork is the space in which we can have public debate about what these experiments mean, then I think that that's, that's quite important and powerful um, and a, an important legacy of Frankenstein as well. So this became another important thread of the project. And finally, um, I know that you, you mentioned the Antarctica trip, which I wasn't actually planning to talk too much about, but I'll just say briefly, in the course of this project, I had an opportunity to, in my mind, retrace uh, Walton's footsteps uh, to go, rather than go to the North Pole, I went to Antarctica as part of a, um, a group of artists that went there to do some wild and fabulous in installations, and I went there to review the show. And part of the question that I came away with was um, really what, what kinds of artistic or creative responses um, to an environment like this sort of legitimate our presence there. So we're familiar with a, a sort of scientific and economic imperative for visiting um, places that are highly sensitive to the impact of our, our presence there, like Antarctica. Um, but this was a one of the first and not the only um, organization of, to take artists to these environments in order to elicit their responses. Not, not to say that they should necessarily produce um, climate change propaganda. This is important, but I think that the mandate of the arts is, is much broader than that. And I think you know this Frankenstein story is testament to that, to say that um, what gets produced in response to a climate crisis 
um, and what is enduring in the space of art or literature might be something uh, much stranger and more vague or more abstract um, than simply a picture of what's happening at a site. Um, so after this, after having this uh, you know, very powerful experience in Antarctica and these reflections on on the specificity of the site, it suddenly dawned on me towards the end of the project, so about a year ago, as I thought I was ready to start sitting down and writing it up, that of course I needed to actually know more about this volcano. Um, Tambora is a story that is well told. Um, it's well known in the scientific literature, but as more, the more I asked around, I realized no one I knew had ever been there or ever even thought about going or knew where Sumbawa was in Indonesia, for example. Uh, Jill and Darcy Wood's book was published in 2014, and this generated quite a lot of interest um, in the topic so that we, we have, over the last two years, heard a lot about Tamboran in the, in the press and as a model for geoengineering, and we've heard about a year without a summer. Um, but I really got to wondering about what, uh, what other stories this mountain had to tell um, locally, regionally. Um, in part, my ability to, to know those stories is limited by my own language facility, which doesn't include any of the, the local languages spoken in Indonesia. But nonetheless, I thought this is an important um, question to ask, is what does an actual encounter with um, this historical narrative and this geographical site afford? So last August, I was accompanied, in fact, by one of the artists that I met in Antarctica to Tambora. I leave this, uh, left this picture up for a little while because I think this is a much more familiar way of looking at the volcano um, than any of the pictures that I came home with. As a satellite photo, you can see the crater is very big. Well, it's hard to say how big is a crater. It's six and a half uh, kilometers of cross. It's not the widest or the deepest, but the explosion was the biggest. So it's one of the contenders for the biggest eruption um, in history. But nonetheless, it's huge and it's daunting. And when you fly over it, it seems as though it kind of takes forever. But in case you wonder, oh, how could we possibly not know this volcano? Well, well, um, if you've traveled in Indonesia, you realize that the whole landscape is dotted with volcanoes. Um, but nonetheless, I was excited to visit the volcanic monitoring station that monitored the biggest volcanic eruption in the last 10,000 years. Um, this was it. It's a simple operation. There's a seismograph that lives in a suitcase, and it looks like it's been there for 60 years, 70 years, I'm not sure quite how long. Um, the computers are, of course, a bit younger, but it's quite a simple operation, and they collect data on the, the rumblings of the mountain, and they transmit it to Indonesia's extremely busy Center for Geological Hazard Mitigation, um, which is not very impressed by Tambora, as it turns out for most of the time, although in 2011 and 12, it did rumble and spew gas and ash for long enough that um, the local population was evacuated. There was some worry that it might er erupt again. Um, but nonetheless, this was not our primary. We, I think when we uh, were on the way to the trip, this kind of anticipatory logic of uh, visiting a huge, you know, a volcano that's had this enormous eruptive potential, would this be a danger? This was present in our mind. Um, arriving there, it didn't seem like a, a concern. Um, and this kind of, oh, it was, there were many things about this experience that kind of challenged my sense of what it means to be aware of a local and a kind of global ecological condition at once. So what, is it, what does it mean to immerse ourselves in a world that we know is changing with respect to climate? And what does it mean to visit a site that has a particular relationship um, to a historical narrative or to our contemporary narrative? Um, so it was a long process of, of climbing the mountain. And uh, it mostly looked like this. We climbed for hours and hours in a fog. Um, Fernando has seen even more pictures of the fog uh, than I'll show today. But uh, there was a very long period of um, immersion and, as it turned out, um, very inspiring reflection afforded by not being able to see even the, the ground beneath our feet. It was so thick that actually the two meters, or give or take, that it takes to look down at your own feet would show you a ground obscured by fog. Um, 
grown over by some small plants. We wondered whether the entire mountain had been, um, it was actually cleared by the volcano, was everything, all of the, um, the surface was covered with uh, molten rock and dust and burned away. Um, but it's also been cleared since by um, a Swedish coffee plantation, by more recently for the purposes of um, planting other crops. So it's a very intensively harvested and farmed landscape. So in the course of, of this trip, we were quite curious how much we would be able to recognize Tambora's eruption as something that had happened in the landscape or whether this would be sort of buried under um, the many other things that had happened. Um, as it turns out, there it's many, many ways it's hard to tell, but there are rocks huge rocks that litter the landscape from you know, near and far, and they look as though they fell burning from the sky yesterday, which is incredible to see. Um, but climbing endlessly through this fog, we had the sense that we didn't know whether we would actually, what, we would, what would happen when we reached the top. We thought we might actually just fall right in um, to the crater, and in fact, we almost did, because it all of a sudden appeared like this, and we realized that uh, what had happened was that the heat from the crater sweeps up into this wall of clouds that accumulates on the side of the mountain and creates just a wall of fog. Um, and suddenly, when we saw this, the a name that we had read about in our inquiries into Tambora and its local language and its local lore came into place. We had read that Tambora can be translated from the local language spoken in the town of Bima as an invitation to disappear. And it's kind of an evocative phrase, and as for we walking in the clouds for hours and hours and sort of playing and hiding and um, you know, seeing how far our voices could carry, um, suddenly this seemed like a very suggestive name of, of what the mountain could have meant to the local people. So it's suggested, in fact, that it was an insult, like get out of here, get lost, you know? Um, but it was also maybe a way of describing the way that the mountain first would hide behind these clouds and then appear again. It used to have an enormous peak, which then, of course, disappeared. And one could imagine looking down into this crater just how much dirt and rock and stone and rubble um, it would take blasted up into the atmosphere to block out the sun and shroud the whole world in darkness for, for three years. Um, so it became, of course, um, in, any, in many ways, a generative meditation on rethinking that historical narrative and um, the way that we have for, you know, the stories that we have to encounter this historical site. It was surprising to hear the share story of Mary Shelley in the Year Without a Summer um, all over uh, from the few people, the few tour guides that we met. Um, visiting the mountain. It seemed that this story had been retold in the Indonesian press. I mean, as, as far as we could understand from the Google translating a lot of articles, um, interest in Tambora had been revived intensively in the region by the Frankenstein bicentennial, which I think is an incredible case of um, the way that uh, global culture comes to confer very new meanings on um, local narratives of a place. Um, but there was also there were also other narratives competing, and one of them was this kind of contemplation of whether Tambora was a, a site, th th whether whether it disappeared as a consequence of a local rivalry or um, a war between um, local groups that had lived there, and whether this was preserved in the language. Um, so, in trying to think about how these interconnected stories tied together then with A Year Without a Summer as a kind of proxy for the entire Tambora, global Tambora crisis, and A Year Without a Winter as a proxy for our, our global environmental crisis today. Um, we realized as we moved away from Tambora that we needed to not only think about the volcano and not think abstractly about climate change, but think more specifically about some of the concrete and local manifestations of our um, our engagements with climate today. So this is what we saw a great deal of as we um, departed from the volcano um, and made our way through Indonesia and, um, and Malaysia. Um, these are bon um, bunches of palm oil fruit um, and vast swaths of the landscape that look like this. Um, at first, it looks like a kind of 
maybe a kind of idyllic tropical landscape, but the regular placement of the trees and their kind of even height and not too much underbrush at all um, beneath is suggestive, of course, of what these are. These are um, oil palm plantations and they blanket vast areas of Southeast Asia. As, as you've probably heard about, um, the burning of the peatlands and jungle is a huge problem in um, this part of the world. They're burned in, en masse in order to clear the old forests and make way for palm oil plantations. Um, this results, of course, in enormous biodiversity loss, compromising habitats for um, indigenous communities and communities that are not living um, directly in the forest but have been dependent on the kinds of pr produce and um, w modes of life um, related to peripheral jungles for a very long time. So the, this is kind of uniformly recognized as a, a huge environmental um, tragedy, not only locally, but also because in, in 2015, for example, it blanketed um, huge areas of Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, huge parts of this whole region were blanketed in a, in a thick, choking, toxic smoke. And Indonesia went into high gear saying, you know, okay, we have to limit the, the burning of the, um, the peatlands and the jungles, but nonetheless, the d demand for palm oil continues, and it continues to make this the fastest growing crop um, available and today. And where does it end up? It ends up in our, our little snacks. Um, I'm sure we have all eaten palm oil today, and we all have it on our skin, in our hair, it's in our toothpaste, it's, it's actually everywhere. And in case you wonder why Nutella, for example, tastes so good and has that nice creamy, smooth feeling, it melts at every temperature. Um, Kinder Bueno is a very popular kind of health snack in Germany. I could go on and on and on. Look at your shampoo bottle. Anything that has vegetable fat, usually palm oil. As it's a highly saturated fat, it's, it's offered as a, a healthier fat. Um, it's a vegetable fat rather than you know a, a dairy or a, um, an animal fat. Um, so it's, it's proffered even as a source of biodiesel. It's proffered as a source of sustainable energy. And it's in something like 50% of processed or packaged foods worldwide. It's also very popular as a cooking oil, um, as uh, something to, you know, um, fry foods in, in in many areas in Asia and Africa. And it's increasingly popular in Europe and, um, and North America as well. And so there's something really kind of dark and haunting about this in the sense that uh, I think the environmental impacts of palm oil are fairly well known. Um, I don't know, if, did you hear about the, um, have, you, have you heard about palm oil and the, the burnings in Southeast Asia? I would say it's one of the, um, it's, it's not so difficult to give publicity to a strip landscape like this. And yet, we kind of continue on munching our snacks. And um, you could say, you know, where is the party? You know, the party, it's a children's birthday party on the, the grave of nature, in a sense. We're just kind of having, we're indulging ourselves in the most banal ways. We know that airplanes and car engines and fossil fuel extraction is a huge driver of climate change. Um, but this is a, a place where we engage in these highly is high impact behaviors and in a way that's filled with banal joy or if if we even notice it at all. So this became um, in this whole experience really but became an inspiration for a new piece um, by the artist who accompanied me to Dambora, um, Julian Charrier. And I'm so thrilled about this, uh, this book. As I'm going to, to launch it on Saturday. Um, this is, became a book in an exhibition called An Invitation to Disappear. And An Invitation to Disappear kind of takes up this question that arises with Tambora, but then arises in very different ways within our interconnected um, climate crisis today, which is how to think about our kind of absent presence in these global landscapes. So in the same way that during the Tambora crisis, people were subject to this kind of global interconnected phenomena. We were, they were breathing Tambora air, they were writing under Tambora skies, they were um, drinking kind of Tambora contaminated water, but no one had any idea. Today we are kind of present in these landscapes, but without any kind of 
robust sense of what that would look like. We see an empty forest, um, we see a candy bar, but to locate ourselves in that space, for example, how do, how do I locate myself um, in, in that palm oil plantation from here? Um, so I should say that this, I was, I feel so um, lucky to be, uh, that this anniversary moment brought us into contact and we recounted this encounter and our trip to Tambora and a series of postcards that led to this project. Um, Julian decided to join me on this climb because he was commissioned to do an installation at the Mauvoisin Dam, which is in the town of Bagnier in Switzerland, which um, experienced a terrible flood in 1818 as a consequence of, um, it has a, there's a glacier high up on the mountain above the town, and every year a, a lake forms behind the glacier. And normally in summer the glacier melts and the, the lake runs out and they, it provides water to a huge region of southern Switzerland. Um, but by 1818, everyone realized that the glacier had gotten too big and the water had not poured out from behind it. And they were well aware that there could be a very dangerous flood and it could affect a huge area, um, a huge number of um, the population of the region. And they actually undertook a, an incredible feat of Swiss engineering and had people drill into the mountain in an effort to release the water. And they did actually drain some of the dam many people killed in the process of um, trying to do this. But nonetheless, the lake did eventually overflow, um, and this was remembered as the, the, the debacle of Mauvoisin. Um, so in commemorating this local event and inviting Julian to contribute to the exhibition, um, we had this incredible moment of realizing that this uh, very Swiss local tragedy was connected to a global interconnected um, climate process that was, um, it was of course caused by the, the whole Tambora crisis. So um, Julian and I went to Tambora and, and of course we told the story and um, we, were, we ended up um, kind of starting to think through this paradox of what it, what it was, what it is that we're doing there. What are we doing actually literally here? And this is a site that we didn't go to. This is a site that we saw from the side of the road, from out the top of the plane, while we were hurrying to get to the site of greater interest. And this is always the problem with, um, with disasters, is that you go for the spectacular one. Of course, we go for the volcano, even the 200-year-old volcano is more excited than vast swath of palm oil plantations. Um, but it was when we were leaving that we realized this is actually the landscape that we visited. So what this project is, um, it centers around a film and it looks, this is the, the visual imagery, it looks very much like this. Um, and one is drawn in very much like we were on the mountain through this mist, this fog, towards something, a kind of object of desire. And as, you, as the camera um, it moves, and this is a 75 minute film, as the camera moves towards this kind of point of colorful and light fluctuation, a sound starts to rise and it's music and you start to realize that it's like a techno beat and it sounds like there's a party, maybe a jungle party if you've ever taken a tropical holiday, you know, full moon party. Something seems to be going on somewhere in the distance. Um, from the look of it, it's hard to say what it is. It could be a fire on the mountain, it could be a volcanic eruption, in fact, what it is, is a party, but for no one. And an invitation to disappear is a kind of meditation on the way that we're, in effect, having, we, this is actually what we're doing. We're, we're partying in the jungle. Our, this, the party is, is there. We might as well be there drinking and staying up all night and dancing on the floor of the forest. But no one's there. And it's a kind of invitation to, to consider our presence within these landscapes. Um, back at the gallery, it's a much more ghastly kind of situation filled with uh, the, the, the fruit of this harvest, these huge blocks of the fat that are extracted from this um, landscape. And they, what they do in this part of the installation is that they power a motor, which is the most loud and horrific sounding thing you could ever 
hope to not spend too much time in this gallery. Um, and it runs on palm oil. And here I think it's, it has a kind of, um, evoke some of the visual rhetoric of Frankenstein, which was very much the artist's intention. Um, it looks sort of like a blood transfusion into this machine. And all it does is it powers a smoke machine. And white smoke fills the gallery, and black smoke goes out the back of the gallery into the parking lot. And I think it's, this is also actually a very, very dark meditation on um, our relationship to these landscapes of extraction. So it's my hope that um, I'm very much in the space of this artwork in the moment, because I just fin finished a long text about it. But I think there were, all of the pieces that um, have come out of this project have been very compelling for me, and I hope that they will be conducive to thinking our way into a global and a very local problem at once. So I um, forgot to set the timer. I think probably I've spoken long enough. But suffice to say, I'm very much looking forward to this book being out um, in August or thereabouts. And you can pre-order it on Amazon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to, to what extent do you think that all the artistic approach to the climate change problem can really be an effective way to establish a dialogue between experts, uh, politicians, and uh, let's say the global debates on, on climate change. You know, for example, could you imagine this sort of exhibitions, for example, in a, in a sort of a UN summit uh, having a real impact in the, in, the, in the global discussion about how to deal with, with global challenge, which is a, a, a terrible, difficult, and puzzling uh, problem we have nowadays. What, what, what do you feel about that in that sense? And my second point is to what extent history is just a sort of inspiration mm or a real way, even methodologically, to try to establish strong comparison between what happened in, in, in the Frankenstein story in, in that, that summer. Uh, to what extent do you think that there is real comparative work or is just a sort of inspiration for you? So I, I would say um, I would be content as a, as a curator, I would be content with it as a source of inspiration. But what I have started to be, I have persuaded myself in the course of the project that that historical moment has more to offer than inspiration, that it's actually, so I, I would say that um, addressing the, the first question, you know, how important or how useful is art or literature in this context, um, I think it remains to be seen whether art or any other thing is, uh, is going to sort of push us over the edge. Um, I think it's important, certainly, um, not so much that one image is going to flip the switch, but that our way of narrating a, a situation is kind of underlies the political landscape. And it was my hope that this project would have political efficacy, um, not from the, I, I thought from in the beginning about taking it directly to a kind of political organization and decided not to do that immediately because I wanted to give it uh, sort of the creative space to turn into whatever it would turn into instead of constraining the message. But towards the end of this project, it has been taken up. Um, so I, I have been running some workshops with the Red Cross, Red Crescent, and we did workshop at the um, COP23 last fall. Um, and they have started taking it up a great deal in their, uh, it's the climate center of that, that organization. They've been using it quite a bit. Um, we held a workshop at the European Commission Joint Research Center and they were quite interested in the way that um, narratives kind of underlie the political landscape. So legislation, perception of risk, perception of um, what, what sort of social and economic conditions are tolerable are there is always a way that these things get decided in terms of an image, a norm, a standard of how things should be. I've started to think that climate change is not going to be a problem until the concept of climate actually changes. So climate is usually something that's in the background. Um, and until it starts to be in the foreground, we, we know that climate change exacerbates income inequality, it exacerbates environmental racism, it exacerbates health consequences, it's a security risk. Everyone knows that it cause, it's a condition of everyday life, 
and it's a condition of trouble. It's a condition of most of the problems that any one of us care about in an active political way. But on a daily basis, if you ask me, are you more worried about climate change or are you more worried about uh, a group of people that are losing their jobs, losing their uh, sa public safety, you know, have food insecurity? Well, it's easy to say, you know, address a more immediate problem and not think about the underlying problem. And climate change is definitely not the only underlying problem causing all of these other historical problems we've had for a long time. But I think climate itself, um, as a background condition, is starting, it's starting to change. It's starting to be a, a primary factor rather than just what makes possible everything else. And that's where I think uh, the arts, the humanities, history, having a different understanding of what climate is might allow us to think very differently in a practical way about what to do about it. Because if it's a thing that you can't count on, if, if nature is not a cyclical patterned, uh, you know, eternal return of the same, um, that's a big problem. And I think, it's, I think it's kind of embedded within our way, our, our kind of idea of climate itself, um, that there's part of the um, inaction. I also think, well, I have other thoughts about why, of causes of inaction, but maybe I'll save that for uh, time for questions, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, do you think that um, the type of cause of the climate crisis have an effect to the difference on the monster, of the type of monsters from Mary Shelley or um, the artwork in, nowadays in this world? I would, I would tend to say I tend to say no, because I think Mary Shelley was very, she was responding very particularly to the historical conditions of her day. So the science of her day, um, the kind of social norms of the day. I think this I, concern about um, the source of life and of making a being uh, was very particular. But if you look, maybe if, if you look more broadly at, at lots of different kinds of arts and literature, you could come to see a pattern, but to say that, um, you know, that I, I don't think we could pr predict what would happen in response to a climate, but that it's more the, the other historical circumstances that would appear differently in light of a climatic disturbance. And one of the big things that I think is, uh, that I hope will come to appearance in our present day that was not a concern for her is that whether, we, whether things are warming or cooling, we have these forms of global infrastructure that are sensitive to climate today that were not in place in, in her day. Um, and we're also comfortable with some of the kinds of science that freaked them out and fascinated them that they wanted to play around with. So, I don't know, it's an interesting question actually because I think, I think we maybe, we wouldn't know unless we had other cases for comparison. But it's, it's entirely possible. I would love to answer yes, but I, I feel like I have to be more conservative. <laughs> what, what do you think? artists now had the uh, awareness that uh, the climate crisis now is provoked by humans, by humans and then borrow as natural uh, product or catastrophe. And I thought that there will be a, an influence in artists mm. now for producing the, the monsters, but mm. I, I don't know. Yeah, perhaps, I mean, I think in a way we, we find ourselves a little bit more similar to Victor these days, maybe. You, 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 mean, you, you used several times the adjective global, but you mm. never used the word globalization. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and you also did not really say very much about the Anthropocene. Mm. You, yeah, it came up, of course. but. Um, and I bring it up because um, 
Okay, so in 1816, uh, Tambora, a uh, huge eruption, it affected weather worldwide and so on. But there was not a global process. Globalization is a human thing. It's not the act of nature. I mean, the fact that the entire earth um, undergoes an ice age, let's put it that way, is, has nothing to do with globalization. It's, it's, it's a general process that affects the entire planet, but it's not globalization. So globalization is a purely, it's a purely human, uh, uh, human um, phenomenon uh, that is not necessarily recent in, in all its forms, but, uh, uh, but has increased. And so I wanted to, to hear a little bit your thoughts about the connection between globalization and the Anthropocene mm. in the framework of your, of your discussion. And something that um, uh, prompts me to ask this question is a phenomenon that you, uh, that you described, which is that Frankenstein becomes part of the cultural heritage of Indonesia, yeah. uh, which is a country that is destroying its cultural heritage, its biocultural diversity at a huge, at an absolutely huge rate. So this is, this is for me, this is for me a, 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 you know, a little sign of some of the potential perversions of globalization, that it is in the end more important for Indonesia to you know, connect uh, to you know, whatever, something that's a remote, uh, remote phenomenon, but uh, at the same time it parallels and I think it goes hand in hand with the destruction of the, of the local. This, this is, mm. so okay, so this is one question. And the other one is just an observation about the dynamics, the dynamics of change, which are also not, not necessarily present in your discussion, which is, what about economics? I mean, what is going to drive the world to consume less palm oil? Yeah? It's not the fact that the forests are being destroyed and that someone is gonna say, oh, let's not destroy the forest. It's economics. Right now, I mean, this very week, there, were, there was a huge protest by a French, uh, um, uh, a French peasants, I don't know, I guess it's no longer peasants, the word, but uh, farmers, yeah, farmers, sorry, that's, that's the word I was looking for. French farmers who want the French government to impose, to limit the uh, import of palm oil, which in France and in Europe is extensively used to, cre to, to produce biodiesel because they say, we are producing other things here in Europe, in France, and we want the Europeans to use that and not imported palm oil. When that happens uh, at, you know, at a huge enough scale, maybe you know, there will be less of a demand for palm oil, and that is going to bring, bring it down. Otherwise, uh, this absolutely, I mean, I'm skeptical about almost any other mechanism mm -hmm. uh, for, for that. Um, um, thank you very much for um, raising this question. And it's, I, I, I certainly have a lot of, of thoughts about globalization and, and the Anthropocene. I kind of, it's, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot there, so I've hesitated about it a little bit. But now we have the chance to talk about it. So, um, I think one of the, uh, globalization of course is a blanket term for, for so many different processes, economic, cultural, communications, um, kind of geopolitical interconnectedness and sensitivity and dependencies. And of course this is, uh, was happening during the Tambora moment and it has developed intensively since then. Um, but the kind of globalization driven by the by colonialism and specifically by the um, Dutch and English colonial relationship to Indonesia in the, the Tambora moment, um, which is still where very many of our narratives of Tambora's eruption came from because the local population was absolutely wiped out. There are very, very few uh, indigenous stories as far as my research um, there has turned up. But there are accounts collected by um, Sir Raffles of um, one of the, the, um, the, sorry, what is he called? The, the boss, um, the, the leader of the, the British colony there at the time uh, made an effort to collect accounts of the eruption. 
of course. Um, they thought it was gunfire. They thought it was part of a you know colonial um, war happening at the time. Also, local lore sometimes construes volcanic eruptions um, through the, a kind of anti-colonial narrative. I've read more about this in a Hawaiian context than an Indonesian context, but I think it's suggestive nonetheless. As con uh, volcanic eruptions sometimes narrated as a kind of revolt of, of the earth or of the, the gods that live in them um, against harmful um, you know, activities going on. So I think the, there, there must have been a richer history of Tambora in the, the context of globalization at the moment, uh, sorry, in the Tambora in the moment of its eruption. Um, it was part of the way that information did circulate, um, of course, at a much slower pace, but I guess I'm particularly concerned about communica communications infrastructure as part of the, um, what, what changes um, the climatic condition of, or, you know, the experience of climatic conditions, um, globalization mediates that. In terms of the um, kind of causal relations, the economic relations, I think, um, what can I say? I mean, I think I'm kind of strict Marxist on this. I think that many of these problems will be far more responsive to economic uh, interests than they will to consciousness raising or anything of the sort. I mean, you know, the, Marx says, you know, operate my le deluge, you know, I'm going to celebrate a deluge of next this weekend. And in fact, the, uh, the institutions and the um, power blocks that are responding to climate change in a significant way are mostly doing so because they're, it's affecting the bottom line. And I mean, maybe nowhere more obviously is this the case than in the, the case of um, there are many decommissioned oil rigs that were dragged up to the, the Arctic and they can no longer drill there because the seas have become so rough and so now they, the oil rig is no longer able to, to drill. So now, you know, okay, we have to have some climate mitigation run by the oil industry, which I have to say, um, the oil industry is also one of the main investors in carbon sequestration technology. So uh, I, I could say a lot more about this, but I just have to recount that Maybe you have come across this story, but there was a little bit of a scandal that has leaked out since the Paris Accord, which goes a little something like this. Are the Paris Accords agreement to try to keep the world under two degrees uh, Celsius temperature rise premised on a fictitious technology? Um, and what that technology is, is called uh, bio, secret, uh, bio, bio diesel, carbon sequestration and capture, BEX. And it involves is growing huge amounts of um, a crop to be determined. It could be soybeans, it could be uh, some other um, f crop that can be turned into biodiesel, burning it, capturing the carbon at the plant, and then storing it somewhere, outer space, underground, wherever. Um, this is, uh, this is the technology construed as perhaps a fictitious technology. Um, it is not, it, it's built into every single um, IPCC scenario that was used in the, to develop the Paris Agreement. It is presupposed that there will be some mystery technology that will produce negative emissions. So it's not enough even if we turned off all the engines and the lights right now. Um, we would have to find a way to suck carbon out of the atmosphere in order to meet these, uh, these goals of limiting rising. The one thing that does that naturally is that the oceans and the forests, plants sequester carbon naturally. They, they bring them into their um, tissue fiber as they grow. So when forests grow, uh, they, they sequester carbon. So it's entirely plausible that we could have um, a world, it would, take, even by the most conservative estimates, um, something like half the world's arable land, like a, a continent the size of, like twice the size of the Indian subcontinent, would have to be covered with um, these biodiesel uh, carbon sequestration plants, completely given over to um, this carbon sequestration technology, you know, sucking the carbon, uh, you know, growing the plants, burning them, capturing the fuel and sucking out the carbon uh, that's emitted in the process of burning and then giving the fuel out and then of course sequestering any remaining carbon. Where is all that carbon gonna go? Well, there's one place, only one place it, it goes right now, which is that it goes back down into the oil wells in Saudi Arabia to help fill them up. 
because they're getting low, and it helps the oil rise up to the top so you can get more out. So I, I learned in the course of my um, employment at, at Arizona State University, which is a, actually a major research center for carbon sequestration technologies, um, Klaus Lackner is a scientist, and he's been working on these carbon trees for a long time. Um, there, there are very serious negotiations to get the billions and billions of dollars that would be required in order to hopefully develop these technologies. And oil companies are really the only forthcoming investors. So, um, yeah, these are, these are the kind of disturbing facts of globalization, of capitalism, of our economic entanglement with the condition of the, of the world, which is to say that palm oil, um, palm oil is a pretty big problem, but it's a drop in the bucket of all of the problems. But what I hope, what I think is really compelling about this project is at once the particularity of dealing with that landscape, but also the kind of, from an aesthetic perspective, um, the provocation to think about how we live in these really contradictory and kind of, I hope, I hope that this exhibition is both deeply seductive and deeply disturbing um, because we are actually incredibly comfortable with climate change. Even I, I would say myself, I think about it, I work on it, but I have to I ask myself, um, is inaction actually because change is something that we're more and more okay with? Um, there's, the, pace, the rate of change, as so many sociologists say, you know, everything's changing faster and faster and faster. The idea that the climate is changing, oh, it doesn't seem like it's changing as fast. I don't have to get a new climate as often as I have to get a new cell phone, you know? Um, so I think that this possibility of locating ourselves psychically in any one of these um, kind of globalized landscapes of extraction and destruction is, is a hugely challenging, and I hope that these stories and images maybe will just be one um, way of, of rehearsing the kind of thinking and awareness and kind of also like grappling with our own ethical and political commitments um, so that we can maybe deploy those ways of thinking elsewhere. Her question. Um, uh, first of all, a uh, nice speech. It's, uh, you, you involve everything, and it's, it's very difficult and it's amazing. Um, well, I'm thinking about, uh, did you study similar cases? And I'm thinking about um, Krakatoa. Mm. And uh, I know that it's two, uh, 2,000 years ago, but uh, I think that it changed everything. Um, that, that's my question. And, Minotaur, I'm not sure if it's in the same date, but Minotaur is also an legend and a, and a monster. Maybe, I don't know. Uh -huh. um... Yeah, I mean, there are actually volcanoes are full of monsters. And um, I often feel like this project has become a monster that's, I've been chasing it around the world and it's, or it's chasing me, I'm not really sure. Um, because of all these reasons, because of the, the interconnections are actually they're, they're hard to convey, but they're really hard to keep track of as well, so I, I yeah, thank you. Um, but I think there are, there are legends, local legends in many places of, of volcanoes being the sort, both a source of life and a source of death. They're very, I think they're kind of imaginatively compelling as a source of monsters. And I think the, the desire to link Frankenstein and a vampire and th those monsters to this volcano very, very far away is just, um, you know, it's, it's implausible in a way because they didn't know about the volcano, but the link is so compelling from a narrative perspective and so suggestive about like how to think about a global context um, that I, w I, wanna, I wanna stick with it and say that they're, these monsters are somehow born of, of this volcano, even if it's a very, uh, you know, it's certainly not a scientific causal argument in any way, but. Sorry. What about geoengineering? Geoengineering, which seems to. Uh, what about geoengineering? Yeah, I think you mentioned mm -hmm. 
one sort sort of uh, promising, but at the same time very dangerous, or is is a sort of new Frankenstein? Do you think, or it's a, what the example you were mentioning before would be part of of a sort of geo geoengineering strategy? To, uh, do you think that is worth pursuing research and present projects that are running now in, in this field? Because I, I think we, we, we used to, 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 to approach our present mainly in terms of uh, bi biotechnologies, uh, communication technologies, uh, any, any other sort of new, new, new materials, nanotechnology, for example. What, what about this, this yeah. uh, geoengineering as a new emerging field? What do you think? Um, you know, I, I've been kind of studying it a bit for the last few years, and I've collaborated with this group called PlanetWorks at, in Arizona. Um, I should just to clarify, I was, I was based in Arizona for a few years, and now I'm based in, in Europe. But um, I still collaborate with them because I think it's not... I, it's not enough to say it's happening anyway, therefore it's fine. That's a good enough reason to say it shouldn't happen. And there are many people that are absolutely against doing geoengineering research. And, and for good reason, I would say the best reason is that it offers a kind of false promise of hope. Um, I think that's a very real concern. I, I also think um, it, geoengineering researchers, I find them reassuring in one way only, which is that in all of the places I've, I've done, been to do my research, I've only met people in these contexts that take climate change as seriously as I think we need to. And that goes for the, I've been to two, only two, but uh, the COP meetings and a lot of um, political context where people are very, care a lot about climate change, but the sense of urgency is nothing like what I have seen um, among these geoengineers. They have the kind of, the sense of urgency about climate change, the way that a paramedic has the sense of urgency about a patient, whereas other people who might have a much broader understanding, holistic sense of health or, um, you know, you need a healthy diet, but when there's someone having a heart attack or something right in front of you, you think about uh, addressing the symptoms. And I think that that approach is, that way of thinking is needed uh, in addressing climate change. And also, because I think some of the, the issues that geoengineering governance raise are issues that need to be raised um, whether or not there's some new newfangled doohickey flying around the sky. Um, they force issues of global governance or of collaborative regional governance um, that the UN doesn't really have uh, resources to, to deal with, and they're relevant not only for geoengineering but for um, for other kinds of regional cooperation, security, um, just for thinking about, for example, um, you know, if if one nation or a private company that was located in one nation wanted to do a geoengineering experiment. Um, what responsibilities would they have to um, neighboring regions, neighboring countries? In, some, in a place like in Europe, that's a very different discussion than it is in America or that it is in Australia, which has a whole continent to itself, right? So these kinds of global policy discussions are, um, they're important and useful and need to be had because they also affect our thinking about um, migration issues, uh, regional conflicts. So I think geoengineering research, partially because it's so provocative and disturbing, and I'm, I actually think it's really important people who are protesting it and calling it, you know, Franken Planet. I think that's actually really important because people really should be worried about it. We should be really, really worried about it. it and it's a kind of lightning rod for criticism. Um, and I think that it actually plays a really important role in the climate change discussion, even if it's sort of like, oh God, if we don't, do something else, we might have to put some th stuff up in the sky. Now, that said, I would say there, at, at present, there's no plausible proposal for anything that would work or be all that useful at any time in the foreseeable future. This is not my perspective. This is like as explained to me as well as I could understand by some of the scientists I've had discussions with. It seems like mimicking the effects of volcanic eruptions. I don't like to call it that, but it only makes sense to me in that way. It's um, 
emitting uh, sulfur dioxide, putting sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere. Uh, it's probably the most plausible um, strategy. That's not the same as carbon capture, which everyone agrees that needs to happen. No one knows how to do it, but um, it could be a relatively harmless thing. I mean, it could be, for example, making it, you know, incentivizing Indonesia not to burn its forest, making having a forest more economically viable than um, making a palm oil snack. Um, and which is to say, also just to say about, about Indonesia, um, this is a global problem. I mean, global demand fuels the destruction, and there are regional and national decisions about how to respond to various kinds of economic opportunities, but it's the, the straw between us and those forests is very, very long, but we're, we're sucking on the straw, you know? <laughs> um, we're the vampires, like, sucking the juice out from very far around the world. And, and so I think, I think having those conversations about uh, technologies, interventions, you know, where, where, our, where the impact of doing something might be felt very far away are really important. Um, and look, I hope for the magic machine, but I don't, I don't really think it's on the horizon, but I, I'm not against doing the research because I think there are important outcomes to it. And I think there was a little bit, this, this, is, this, this is the end, but it's a little bit depressing as an end, but I guess it's also, it's also realistic. Y de todas maneras, te agradecemos una conferencia muy interesante. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was really good, although it depressed us a little bit. Um, I just have to say thanks so much, and um, I wouldn't I wouldn't be happy if I sent everyone home smiling and uh, munching a candy bar. But um, I hope it's provocative enough. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs>